We know people were outcast back then with leprosy, if they were sick, if they were poor, if they were disabled, if they were from a different area of the world and were trying to live there. A lot of times these people would be pushed to the side. And it sounds horrible, but we still kind of do that today. Maybe not in those exact same ways, but, you know, we see a lot of, a, a lot of stuff about, you know, people fighting, whether it's over their political views, whether it's over someone's skin color, whether it's their religious beliefs. It still happens, and it was happening then. So, you have two people groups, the Jews, which Jesus was a Jew, obviously, and then you have the Samaritans. And this, these were not two people groups that got along. And the Bible actually can kind of tell you, um, give you, you know, more background in the Old Testament as to why that would be. I don't have enough time, and I will spare you that long spiel about how it came to be this way and why they don't like each other, but read it for yourself. What I'm going to tell you about tonight is, what made the Samaritans and the Jews different? So their ethnic and cultural differences, is, like that made them distrust each other. So obviously, two different people groups, they believe two different things. They also had different political differences, which made them surprisingly angry at each other. Shocker, right? And then their difference of religion, that was a total like deal breaker with them. So you've got two people groups here that have a bad history with each other. So tonight we're going to pick up in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Um, I'm going to start in verse 7 with reading, but I'll kind of give you some, a little bit of information. So Jesus and the disciples here, they're going back to Galilee, and they stop in Samaria. Um, he sends the disciples to go to get food at Chick-fil-A or something, and Jesus is sitting there at the well. And so I'm going to pick up here at verse 7, and you all can follow along with me, and I will do my best to read this in a somewhat of a timely fashion, so I can talk about it. So it says, When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. See, I wasn't making that part up about Chick-fil-A. And the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, and did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back to draw water. And he told her, go and call your husband and come back. This is where the story gets interesting and maybe even a little awkward. She replies to Jesus and says, I have no husband. And then Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands and the man you live with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you, the Jews, claim the place to worship, or the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Sorry. And the woman, <clears throat> woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. I always think that's interesting because we often, everybody's talking about seeking God, and Jesus here, he's talking about, like, God is seeking these types of people that worship him. So I just think that's interesting. Anyway, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared and changed her life forever and said, I, the one speaking to you, am he. That was a lot of scripture to read. I understand. Now I'm going to try to make all this make sense. So the conversation that Jesus has, he rose above all of the, the rhetoric and all the hoopla between these two people groups. He's sitting there, he walks up to this woman, or she walks up to him, I'm sorry, and he asks her for a drink. At that time, for these two people to even talk to each other, obviously she is an unmarried woman, that's kind of a problem back then. She's also a Samaritan, and Jesus throws all that aside. Jesus valued her, Although, you know, 
they were completely different as far as, you know, Jesus was a Jew. It's easy to say, oh, okay, well, of course Jesus was nice to this girl because Jesus is God. Right. On the flip side, though, the woman didn't have to be nice to Jesus either. So you see how this whole, like, thing is changing? These are two people that should have never really had this conversation. And I thought today, when looking at this, if I had trade places, would I have even had the conversation? Or would I have just let it go? So Jesus, obviously, he values her. He starts a conversation with her, treats her with respect, and shares the good news that changed her life. And the Samaritan woman, at the same time, she gives Jesus a drink of water. She listens to him. And then guess what happens? These two people that should have never really had this conversation at all, Samaritans and Jews, this is a rivalry that goes far past Red Sox, Yankees, far past Cowboys, Eagles, far past Celtics and Lakers. Like, it's, it's bitter. So imagine how things could change if we acted that way with the people that we necessarily don't want to be around or don't like because of things we disagree on. Everyone would have expected Jesus to probably ignore and condemn this woman because obviously, you know, Jesus is God. Jesus knows the sins of everyone. And he could have just been like, you know, this woman's up to no good and, you know, she's had five husbands and she's a Samaritan, so I'm going to go find something else to drink somewhere else. But he didn't because that's not the kind of God we serve. So, what's one way, and someone can... Just shout out an answer here. What's one way of valuing people who are different than us? Like, how does does that help when we do that? What does that give us the opportunity to do? If, let's say, Zach and I have nothing in common except the fact that we both have facial hair. And, you know, I see him. And, you know, maybe before, like, we've tried to avoid each other. But finally, I'm like, you know, okay, I'm going to give Zach a chance. And let's say Zach doesn't know Jesus. And so... You know, we start to get to know each other a little bit. And as a Christian, we're all guilty of this because sometimes our priorities get mixed up. But as a Christian, one, one of the first things I should want to do is know if this person is saved. Because I don't care what somebody's done to you. There have been things that have happened to me um, in my life, and, and I've harbored a, harbored a lot of bitterness. But I can tell you now, I don't hate anybody enough to not tell them about Jesus and to let them just throw their eternity away. So, you know, you really miss out when we do this canceling thing or this cancel culture. When we decide that we want to cancel out a certain people group or these people or, you know, whoever because we don't necessarily agree with everything, what we're actually keeping from them too, if these people aren't believers, is Jesus. So we see Jesus gives us a perfect example here of how to, you know, handle ourselves. There was no debates. There was no, there was no argument here. He simply told her, You know, I'm the living water, and if you drink from me, you won't thirst again spiritually. So, whether you follow Jesus or not right now, there's another little bit of scripture I want to look at, and like I said, whether you know him yet or not, there's a lot that can be learned from this, just as any of the scripture. But we're going to look at, real quick, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. And this is Paul. Paul's writing to Timothy, who would be very young in ministry. I understand the feeling. And he says this to him, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage. We're really good at the correct and rebuking part. The encouraging, it gets kind of tough, I understand. But I like this part, with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So Paul warns Timothy that people tend to believe, this may shock you, they tend to believe or only listen to what they like and what they agree with. And he specifically here he's talking about theology or what people would believe about God. But that's true in a lot of things. We prefer to hang out with people who look like us, think like us, act like us, behave like us, believe the same things we do. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. The only thing is, Zach, let's say you and I were exactly alike, and we just hang out with each other all the time. You're really going to learn anything new from me? Right. So, we kind of forget 
to try to put that same value that Jesus put in the Samaritan woman. We, we forget, we, for, we just tend to throw all that out the window when we're looking at our own lives. But, you know, how else are you going to learn? I'm not saying necessarily, you know, th- there are so many situations with this where I would encourage you, you know, if somebody's doing certain things, you probably don't need to hang out with them. But if it truly is just based on, you know, what they believe or, you know, what, what it is that, you know, however they feel politically or what sports team they like even or, you know, that you're really kind of taking a lot away from yourself and jipping yourself and you also could be robbing them, most importantly, if they are not a believer of the salvation that's only found in Jesus. And, and that's the biggest thing. So through this conversation, Jesus actually challenged his followers, his disciples, because they probably would have been really blown away because they were all Jews. So he challenged them, both the Jews and the Samaritans, to love people who are sometimes hard to love or you've been taught not to love even, because I'm sure that happened a lot here too. Like, hey, you know, don't go over there because that's where the Samaritans live and they're no good. So through Jesus' example, here he is challenging us to love people that aren't like us. And that, I mean, that's not easy to ask. That's hard to do, whether you want to admit it or not. It is, because like I said, you know, when I think about people I've canceled out in my life, a lot of them are even family members. And, you know, shame on me. I'll wear it. And it's just something I've had to work through. So, I'm going to go back to John and read verse 39 through 42. And this is a little bit later on in the story. But, It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. So, started the story. Jesus, Samaritan woman. These people don't like each other. They have this conversation. Next thing you know, these bitter enemies are saying, hey, this guy's the real deal. Why don't you hang out with us for a few days? Just totally flip the script like Jesus does in everything else. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have seen for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So, the Samaritan woman would have been like a lot of us. What would have been lost there? I don't know how many people were brought to Jesus. Um, I'm sure there's a theologian in here somewhere that might, but... You know, I just think about how many times, and it's, it's sad, but like how many people I've met and stuff and, and how many relationships I had that even if I did eventually talk about Jesus, you know, it might have been later on because I didn't want to have that awkward conversation or I didn't want them to cancel me out and not listen to me. But it's, uh, it, it, can be, it can be tough. But here's the thing. The Bible calls us to love God and love who? Right, our neighbor. And then, you know, there's that part where the guy's like, who's my neighbor? You know, there's always that guy. But there's really no, there's really no, like, there's not parentheses, like, only if they're this, that, the other. It's, it's to love everyone. And guys, when it gets hard to love other people that aren't like us, this is what I think about. I think about the fact that Jesus, knowing everything that I've done, everything that I was going to do, Everything that you've done, everything that you were going to do, everything anybody in the world has done and was going to do, even after accepting him, he still willingly, willingly gave himself up as a sacrifice to bring us back to God. So, just like Jesus confronted the Jews with the reality that God loves the Samaritans too, the people that you've been thinking about when I've talked about this canceling, God loves them too. It's easy to forget But it starts in Genesis by telling us when Adam and Eve were made and when people are created, they're what? Made in God's image. They're made in the image of God. And I'm even sitting up here right now thinking about people I kind of have a hard time being around and I'm like, you know, as hard as it is to believe so and so, they're made in the image of God. So remember that. I know it's hard. I know right now especially, it seems like lines are being drawn all over the place in the sand and that, you know, if you don't like, 
even just with one thing, if, if you don't agree with me on this, then we're just done. I heard somebody else talking about, um, you know, they may have potentially lost a friend because of something. It, it's, it's just crazy. There's, there's, there's so much more to it than just, you know, friendship is so much more, or relationships in general are, are about so much more than just differences of opinion. So, the people you struggle to love are made in God's image. Our differences don't have to divide us. And we can love each other even when we don't agree. Because, guess what? Even with some of your best friends, I bet you still don't agree with everything. So, think of someone right now who you've canceled completely. Don't want to talk to them, don't want anything to do with them because of X, Y, Z. Whether it's something they did to you, something they said to you, you know, whatever the case is. Think of that person. And I'm going to try to challenge you a little bit. So everybody, everybody kind of think of somebody. Nod your head if you've thought of somebody. I have two, so I'll nod my head. This week, what can you do? What can you do to really just get through to that person, kind of break down the walls, the barriers that you've put up, whether, you know, like I said, there could be a million things that would cause somebody to just cancel someone out of their life. But think about this. Whoever they are, you could have somewhat of a conversation like Jesus and the Samaritan in the sense of, you know, you see them somewhere, start a conversation. Treat them with respect. Because, for one, I know this sounds really weird to say, and I haven't always been the most respectful person, but there's no reason for disrespect. No reason. Even if, even if you have literally nothing in common. Nobody, there's, there's no reason to be disrespectful about whatever it is that you're doing. But treat them with respect. Even serving them, helping them, and listening to them, and last, learning from them. Um, I've had conversations with people of, of even other religions and, you know, my faith in Jesus will not be compromised ever, no matter what. But, you know, I, I have to say I have learned things, not in the sense of, obviously, religion, but, you know, there's, there's just been people that, you know, 10 years ago I never thought I would have conversations with or, or people from other areas of the world, and I've learned a lot. So I challenge you tonight, you know, don't miss opportunities to share the gospel with people that really need it just because you want to cancel them because you think it's easier just to not have them around. shutting the computer and getting serious. So, we're going to be talking about this for the next month. It's going to be interesting. Um, I hope tonight this kind of gave you a, a little bit of an idea of just, you know, how to approach these situations, especially in this season of life that we're all living in right now and looking at what Jesus did and what Jesus would do now. So, look at that. It's 736. Guys, I'm going to I'm going to pray for us, pray us out. Um, I would like, you know, I can go through and ask, but uh, anybody have prayer requests? If you do, just raise your hand just, just to make it known. I was going to tell you all, um, I appreciate everybody here that prayed for my dad. He got uh, really good news um, last week, uh, cancer-free, so that was awesome. Uh, there was no cancer there. He is going to have to have surgery, but at least there is no cancer, so that was great. And I just want to say thanks. Um, that's kind of my praise report, and I've been thinking about that periodically throughout the week when I get discouraged. So um, with that, I'm going to pray for us. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to, to come here and to read your word, God, and to just soak it up, soak it in, and understand how we as Christians should present ourselves, even with people that, you know, we don't necessarily want to be around. God, we know that everybody needs you. One of the few things that we all have in common is the fact that we need you, Jesus. And just help us to remember that when we're in these situations. Help us to remember that everybody is made in your image. And help us to carry your gospel, not only through our words, but through our actions wherever we go. Lord, just be with our world and our country today. God, we just know that no matter what happens, Lord, you're in control. You've reigned. You've been here before the world, and you will be here forever. You are eternal. And we thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you for the fact that you don't change. You've been the same yesterday. You're the same today. You'll be the same forever. And Lord, most of all, we want to thank you for saving us. 
And I pray right now, if there's somebody in here that doesn't know you, Jesus, that they make that decision. They make that decision tonight. It's the most important decision, Lord. But I pray for them as well. I pray for all the prayer requests that were made known and even those that didn't raise their hands, Lord. I pray for everybody in this room, everybody watching online. I just pray for peace in this time. Lord, just keep the anxiety away from us and let us just rest in the fact that you don't change and that you control everything. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.